are going to take uh, the next two weeks uh, tonight and next Wednesday, Lord willing, to look at Psalm 86. And uh, really, the emphasis tonight is just on the idea of effective prayer. How, how are we to pray? You really, you look at people and you, you trust that they pray in, in a church, in any given church. Where you have a Christian church, you would trust that the people that are in that church not only pray when they are at church, but they pray uh, together as families and they, they pray as individuals. And, and it's not only formal times when they bow the knee before the Lord, but it is uh, time just going through the day and making sure that you have a connection with God and you pray. But I can't know, and you can't know if a person is praying or not accurately. And the reason for that is is that Christians have become as adept as the uh, Pharisees were in their day at making a show, uh, a pretense at things like praying, uh, this discipline that God has put before us. So only God can really search the heart and know whether or not a person is uh, praying or genuine even in their Christianity among us. As a matter of fact, we have to be careful because the Bible talks about the fact that we can deceive ourselves into thinking that we're okay and we kind of lull ourselves into a sense of complacency. And that, that's why we really try to stress this idea of being immersed in God's Word, knowing God's Word so well that we not only memorize it, but we think about it often. We meditate upon the Scripture so that we know that God is filling us with the thoughts that we need in order to pray aright. Now, I would look at especially the Psalms if I was having a struggle praying, and this is why we go through the Psalms on Wednesday night, because the Psalms teach us to pray God's way. David prays in this Psalm, Psalm 86 here, and we know that David is a man after God's own heart because the Bible tells us so. I mean, you could tell me I'm a man after God's heart or I'm a woman after God's heart, and I could tell you that. Uh, but it's not recorded in the Bible that we are the that we are this, but it is recorded when when we when we look at David. So, in other words, if we want to be people after God's own heart, then we're going to have to come boldly before God's throne of grace in exactly the same way that David did here. I would say that we could use this psalm as a good litmus test on how to pray effectively. And first of all, I'd just like to look at the petitions that are here in this psalm. Uh, when I say petition, I'm talking about what is it that God wants us to ask of him. Now, you can count it up, and there are 12 specific petitions. There are 13, actually, but there's some overlap. So if you boil it all down, there, there are 12. 12 specific things that David asks for in prayer. And so if my prayer is going to be right before God, then I'm going to have to verbalize these requests in my own life. But I'm going to be putting them in my own words. For example, would you ever think to ask God, uh, hear me, Lord, please hear me? I mean, I don't think that would naturally occur to us. Our head tells us that, of course, God hears us. God God hears everything that we do. God sees everything that we do. He, he is everywhere. So why are we asking him to hear us? Well, I only know from personal experience that my head tells me that God hears me, but my heart feels like he doesn't hear me. And so I think what David is saying here is, I, I, I want to just get out there and verbalize this, Lord. I need you to hear me. I was talking to someone a few days ago, and they said something. And, and it was something that was obvious to me that they didn't need to say it out loud. And I, I, made, I, I, I said that to them. You don't have to say that out loud. Um, I know what you would do. And, and this person stopped me before I could finish. And, and they said, oh, no, I have to say it. I got to get it out. I have to verbalize it. Well, that's how David feels here. I've, I've got to get this out. I've got to verbalize this, Lord. I know you hear me, but I want you to hear me, right? That's the idea. Why ask God to preserve my life or to save it? Isn't that interesting? I mean, would it ever occur to you? You say, well, no, because 
I'm not facing armies like David did. I'm not in a life-threatening situation. Maybe at some point in your life it did occur to you for God preserved me, saved my life. When I got my cancer, I felt that way. But I'm not just talking about during the crisis moments when we are in constant danger. But I, I'm talking about the fact that our lives mean something to God. I mean, isn't it true that every human life is tenuous at best? James put it this way in James chapter 4 and verse 14. He said, for what is your life? It is as, even as a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. I, I cannot presume upon God. God has me here. He has a purpose for me. And I would say that God values my life more than I value my life. That's why I think it's important to pray, Lord, preserve my life. Maybe I don't ask for God to preserve my life because I don't value my life in the way that God values it. That's a different concern, altogether all different. Maybe we ought to be praying, and I pray this too, Lord, I know you value, this is one of my prayers, Lord, I know you value my life more than I do. Help me to recognize that and to live my life in a way that's worthwhile, right? Because sometimes... We just as soon go home, right, and check out. But that's not what God has for us. God has a purpose for us to be here. Should Christians ask for God's mercy? Do you know that that's what he's asking for, right, the mercy of God? Do you know that there are, there are Christians who teach that you should not ask for God's mercy, that you don't need to confess sin, that you don't even need to ask for God's grace? And the, the reasoning behind that false teaching is you already have these things, right? And, and we say to ourselves, well, we do. We have the grace of God. We just went through Romans. We found out all those benefits that we have in, in chapter 5. But, but let me say to you that for Paul in the New Testament, he prayed for grace, mercy, and peace to be upon people and to be upon himself. So if the Apostle Paul is praying that, we should be praying it too. We need to pray for God's mercy. You say, well, you know, God is, God, is not going to, uh, God is not going to put me in hell. He has saved me from my sin. My sin is under the depths of the sea as far as the east is from the west. Why would I be praying for God's mercy? Because you need God's mercy daily. You say, well, why do I need God's mercy daily if I'm his child? Because you betray him and others and you sin and you need the mercy of God. You say, well, why do I need that mercy? I need God's mercy so that his chastening will remain light and not become severe. And do you know what some people do? Some people actually presume upon God and they say, well, I haven't felt this heavy chastening, so I'm not going to ask for mercy. I'm, I'm just going to kind of check out of prayer altogether. And then they wonder why their lives are falling apart if they're Christians. And if there is no chastening and no conviction at all, then the Bible says that they're illegitimate and they're not children at all. I can't judge that. You can't judge that. Only God can judge that. But it's true. There are pretenders around us. And then Paul says to here, or not Paul, David rather, he says, rejoice the soul of your servant. Do you ever pray that? I think that's an excellent prayer. Rejoice the soul of your servant. What does that mean? Lord, put joy inside of me. Do you pray that? I want a sense of joy as I live my life. And I, I have to say, I don't always feel that way. Sometimes I feel a dead on the inside. But I want God to ignite in me a sense of joy. I want to know experientially, not just in my head, but experientially that everything is right between God and me. And not only that, I want joy in what I'm doing. I want a sense of supernatural peace and comfort. I don't want it to be based on people, but I want it to be based on my relationship with God. So how am I going to get that? I'm going to get that by asking for it. Lord, rejoice the soul of your servant. Is that on your prayer list? I mean, think about that. So if we're going to ask for right things, then one of the things that we're going to need to ask for is joy. And we need to... Uh, follow David in his uh, in his example here. Now, these are there are other petitions. We can't go through them all tonight. Uh, I'll leave them out for you, maybe to flesh out in your own prayer life. Pick them up and 
put them on your prayer list. I, I simply point out that when you pray for what is listed in Psalm 86, you know that you're praying for the right things because this is the word of God. And this is what God wants you to ask. And I think that this is exactly what will produce within you a spirit-driven life and not a mechanical life. Oh, well, I, I just pray because I have to. But no, you're, you're driven by God's spirit. You're moved by his spirit to pray and to pray right. But there's more in this psalm than just the specific petitions that are listed here. There's a rationale that comes behind the requests. Uh, in other words, there are principles, at least two of them in this psalm, that kind of undergird a prayer life. We could call them the philosophical foundation behind prayer. And they're very simple. Our need and our God. Those are the two major philosophical uh, undergirdings for our prayer effort before God and that's what makes prayer effective you say well what do you mean our need what I mean by that is why why did David pray why should I pray and so David a answers us by saying like in verse 1 we we are poor and needy he says for I am poor and needy that's why I want you to hear me so I'm poor and needy so I'm recognizing that I need God that's our need right our need we are holy you say how does that communicate our need well what does the word holy mean it means that we have been set apart for God and we have things that God wants us to do his will if we've been set apart to do something especially for God we need to know what that is right God has put us in that place and so we depend upon him and we beg him to reveal that to us Otherwise, we're just kind of shooting from the hip and doing things the way that we think that they ought to be done, but we've never taken the time to ask God. The, the third thing that I see here is, for I cry to you all the day long in verse 3. What does that mean? If you're crying to God all the day long, would it be safe to assume that you're in fellowship with God? I would say yes. If you're always talking to God and crying out to him throughout the day, even... Your, your lips are not moving, but you're communicating with God. Or maybe you're like Hannah, the lips are moving. Nobody can figure out what you're saying, but you're saying something, and it's to God. You're crying out to him, and you're crying out to him throughout the whole day. That's fellowship. Okay, so we need that fellowship, and we need it from God. We need to spend time with him. We need communion with him. Sometimes people will say, oh, I need more fellowship. And what they mean by that is they need more friendships or they need to be with other believers more. But really, and we do need that, right? But really, all we need is fellowship with God. I mean, if my God is there and I know he's there throughout the day, I can handle anything, even being alienated by those who are closest to me, right? I think that's true. And we are dependent upon him because look at verse 2, it says, I trust in you who trust in you I trust in you and so trust means dependence it means believing again these are just a few phrases you could cultivate some more from this chapter but once we capture the principle of need our prayers are rightly framed then we go to the second principle that undergirds a philosophy of prayer and that's the idea of our God the character of our God is the major it is the major governing principle behind prayer. It is what motivates us. Because once you recognize your need and you're pointed toward your God, then you understand, wow, he can meet my need. Or you deny the fact that he can meet your need. See, there are a lot of people that will not pray because they, they just don't see God working or answering their prayers they don't have any organized way of approaching their prayer life. And they just kind of think that the good things that are happening to them are a happy coincidence. The bad things that are happening to them are just kind of like a karma thing. Even Christians behave this way. And yet God has revealed to us his character. You are a needy person, and I'm powerful enough to meet your needs. That's what he's saying here. You say, how do you see that in this text? You know, there are three names for God used in the psalm. The word Lord, all capital letters. Then the word Lord with just the capital L with the small O-R-D. And the word God. 
Do you know there's a difference between Lord all capital letters and Lord with the small O-R-D? Do you know what that difference is? In order for you to understand this psalm, you need to know why they are different. All capital letters means the, the Hebrew word, I am. So when you read, he is Lord, all capital letters, he's saying, I am. I'm self-existent, I'm self-sufficient, I'm the source of all things, I'm sovereign, I'm in control, I can handle anything that comes into your life. I am. That's what he's saying. When he uses the word Lord with a small O-R-D, it means Adonai, it means master. He's saying, you are in control. Jesus is king, we sing. He controls everything. And he does. He controls everything. By him, all things consist. He literally holds everything together. He is the master. He controls it all. And so what do I need to do? I need to submit to his authority over me. That's the idea. And by the way, joy is only going to come to those who truly serve the Lord. So for me, serving the Lord means that he's the master and I'm the slave and it's the best when it's working that way. His authority over me is the safest place for me to be. That's the idea. But he just doesn't stop there. He, he gives us another title, the, the, the name God. From the Hebrew root, that means strong. He's the strong one. He is omnipotent. So he is able to preserve me, to deliver me. His strength drives me to trust in him. His power gives to me peace. God is powerful enough to answer my prayers, all of them, at any time that I pray them because I'm his son, you're his daughter. We belong to God. We're children of God. And then he goes on and he gives us all kinds of words too, like words like merciful and good and forgiving. And, and we know those words. He's, he says it this way when he, when he talks about his mercy, long-suffering and compassion and kind. Verse 5 says, abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. He's good. What does that mean? It means that everything that he does is beneficial in our lives. All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. He's good. As a matter of fact, he's the, I've been memorizing a passage in Deuteronomy chapter 28 that talks about the fact that God gives good things, good treasure from the heavens, even his reign. These are good things that we should be asking God for. When God created everything, what did he say? He said it was good. And when he got done with Adam and Eve, he said it was very good. God gave us good things on this earth and he provides for us and he's forgiving He's forgiving. That means that he will dismiss all of our sin. You say, but I thought my sin is all gone, past, present, and future. It is. But every time that you sin as a believer, okay, God expects you to confess it. How unnatural would your relationship be if you've never acknowledged your wrongdoing before God? I can't even imagine that. Can you imagine insulting my wife and, and, and saying something terrible to her and then just kind of going on like it never happened? That's ridiculous. Even in human relationships, we know we've got to say when we're wrong and apologize and restore uh, our relationships. Why aren't we doing that with God? Why would we presume upon his goodness? He's forgiving, but he, he wants us to ask. Confess your, your faults to one another. Confess your sins to God. That's what God wants us to do. So there, there's prayer and, and the petitions there. There's prayer and the principles. Um, then the final, the final thing that I wanted to talk about this evening is the performance of prayer. You say, what do you mean performance of prayer? What I mean is as we pray, God is working. He is, he is uh, Ephesians puts it this way, we're his workmanship. We're a poem of God. God is creating, God is performing a wonderful thing in and through us when we pray. You say, what do you mean? What I mean is your whole character is transformed when you pray. You become more like Jesus as you live out your life. You say, but I thought when we pray that we're praying for specific needs. That's true, we are. 
We're praying for specific needs. And I don't think we should stop praying for specific needs. As a matter of fact, I believe that prayer changes my situation, prayer changes things, prayer changes people. I believe that. But most of all, prayer changes me. It changes my character. I begin to understand that God is God and I'm not his equal. I can't just flippantly talk to him like he's my buddy upstairs, uh, a sugar daddy or some sort. You know, this is how people talk to God these days. God is not that way. When we pray, there is only one throne and it's the throne of grace and it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. It's God's throne. We can't have our own throne and say, my will be done, God. It's his will be done. That's what we need. We need to recognize that God's will needs to be done in our lives and his mercy needs to be poured forth. Secondly, we need to understand that when, what, what is it that pleases God when we approach him? In other words, it says, For thus saith the Lord, or the high and lofty one rather, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place. So how do I approach that? How do I get near that? He says, well, I'm with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the heart of the contrite ones. That's how you get there. In, in Psalm 51, 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. So that's the approach that pleases God. Abasing yourself gets you high with God. You're up there with him in his throne room and he's pleased with you. That's the approach that he's pleased with. Third, we understand that God is always faithful and loving toward his children just like we are. We're not perfect. Uh, we, we do things that are selfish at times with our own children. The uh, Bible says that we even correct them in that way, in a selfish way at times. But with God, it's never that way. God looks at us as dear children. And sometimes we're tempted to focus on our sinfulness to the point that we don't understand that God's grace abounds much more than our sin abounds. That's true. But here's the corrective here, in case you just dwell on that and that alone. While God is always willing and always able to forgive you and to restore a relationship with you, you have to be willing to repent and to forsake your sin. If you're not willing to do that and to live right before God, depending upon him, then you're going to have a hard life. Verse 15 says, But you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in mercy and truth, but are we asking for it? And then finally tonight, we must understand that God himself is zealous and fervent in, in his work on our behalf when we pray. Psalm 86, 6 says, Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer and attend to the voice of my supplication. You see, David would not rest. He cried out to the Lord all through the day. He would not rest. He would not let go of God because he was committing himself to the God who never slumbers or sleeps. And he needed to have that measure of satisfaction and confidence and peace knowing that God had control of the situation. We press on in prayer without fainting and without ceasing because we know that God hears us. All day we cry out to God, David said. We persevere because we know that God will prevail. We know that our wrestling with God will turn out for, with, for our peace with God, just as it did with Jacob. We trust that the Lord will uh, encourage you to pray not just tonight, but as you go throughout your day, not just in your formal times, but praying without ceasing.